Hello. It's from this microphone. Well, that's what I was trying to figure out if I should unplug that.
Good morning and welcome to worship here at Lakeshore Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Guess where I used to work. I am your guest minister this morning, Lindsay Biddle. I'm a minister of the Presbytery of Northern Waters and a colleague of Carrie's, and it is indeed my pleasure to fill in for Carrie while I believe she's on vacation, a well-deserved vacation this morning. Let us hear our choral call. Good morning. You know, in uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote to the Corinthians who were struggling at that point, and he said uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase to added affliction he addeth his mercy to multiply trials his multiplied peace his love has no limit his grace has no measure his power has no boundaries known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed, ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's forgiving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundaries known unto men. For his infinite riches and Jesus he giveth and giveth and giveth again His love has no limit, His grace has no measure, His power has no boundaries known unto men. For out of His infinite rich 
Thank you for that words of assurance of God's grace. Let us call ourselves to worship. Oh God, we gather to worship you as members of your worldwide household of faith. If at first we happen to be strangers, remind us we are neighbors and turn us quickly into friends who love one another as we we love love ourselves. ourselves. Let us join in our hymn of praise. We sing to you, O God. prepare ourselves to confess our whole lives to God. This is not just about what we've maybe done wrong or what we have failed to do right. This is about emptying our whole selves to God in offering. God doesn't care about things. God cares about what is heavy on our heart, what weighs down our soul, what disturbs our minds, what makes our bodies anxious. Let us bring all of that to God in confession as we pray together. Compassionate God, Week after week, we acknowledge our sins only to return again and continue in past patterns. 
Free us from that which restricts new life. In your grace, have mercy upon us, O God. Let us continue. Forgive us and give us over to the power of your spirit to be your disciples. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, in Christ we are a forgiven people. Free to live, each one of us, as new creations. Amen. We're going to sing Holly Hallelujah twice. I think we clap on the second time. Is that correct? All in order? Thank you. <clears throat> join in passing the peace of Christ to one and all.
Annie. I'm going to ask if Annie would like, Addie, thank you, if Addie would like to come forward and help me do a magic trick. Hi, Addie. I love your hair. Come on up here. Okay, this is the magic trick. We're going to turn all those people into children. Okay? So they can have the children's sermon. And you and I can lead it, okay? All right. You're the children. Thank you for being with us this morning for the children's message. What do you think would be a good message? Are you getting ready for school? What are you doing to get ready for school? Pack your backpack. And what do you put in your backpack? School stuff. Right. Put what you need into your backpack. Think of your hearts and your souls as your backpack. Put only those things in there that you need because if you put too much in there, what happens? <laughs> your what? Your back, it becomes too heavy. Yeah. If you carry around more than you need, it's going to weigh you down. And you're not going to be there wherever you're supposed to be. Are you looking forward to seeing friends you haven't seen over the summer? All right. Do you enjoy school? Can I put you on the spot? You do. I did too. I did too. Do you get good report cards? All right. Can I tell you about my first grade report card? What grade are you going into? Four. Wow. You'll be ready to earn your doctorate any moment. When I was in the first grade, the teacher wrote on my report card that I still have to this day, Lindsay tends to sing loud and off key and get the rest of the class off key. Do you know what that makes me? A leader. A leader. So, sing your life, sing your heart's desire, and don't worry what it sounds like. You already are a leader. Great. Thank you, and we'll turn all these children back into adults. Or should we keep them as children? Okay, good. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Our readings are from Exodus. I uh, scanned through it and can't say I actually remember these, these scripture readings. So this will be kind of interesting if you open your pew Bible to page 60. Uh, we're reading Exodus. First reading is 8 to... Uh, Chapter 1, 8 to 22. I can talk louder. Okay. Now a new king arose over Egypt, and he did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. 
Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Python and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites, and they made their lives bitter with hand service and mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all tasks that they imposed upon them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, if it's a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded. But they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and they give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrew you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. That's the first reading. You know, life is full of challenges, as we all know, and whether it be singing off key or whatever you may be doing in life. And we know that however we are supposed to be singing and praising God, we know that. And it's just people, some people say, well, I can't sing. Well, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. What is a joyful noise? It's your interpretation. Okay, so don't hesitate to sing. Uh, I'm going to be singing the song Until Then, and I'm sure it's something that all of you know. My heart can sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final but until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city. Until God calls me home. The things of earth will dim and lose their value if we recall their borrowed for a while. And things of earth that cause the to tremble, remember there will only bring a smile. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until
children with joy I'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day God calls me Listen to this. This weary world with all its toils and struggles may take its toll of misery and strife. The soul of man is like a waiting fountain when it's released it's destined for the skies but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy I'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day God calls me Our hymn of illumination is to a very familiar tune, O Little Town of Bethlehem. I wrote the words to go with the scripture we're hearing this morning. To follow the first, the verses in the first chapter, I invite us to join in singing the first verse, and we'll hear... Uh, We'll, we'll sing now, and uh, you can feel free to stay seated. We'll, we'll just sit for the hymns. Great. Continuing in Exodus chapter 2. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. 
His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and while her attendants walked beside the rivers, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse this child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to the mother, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because I drew him out of the water. We're going to continue with the uh, Song of Illumination. Shall we stand? An Before I begin to unpack this wonderful and amazing story, which I would entitle The Moseses of Moses. You know how Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth are called the Moses of their people. Well, there were in fact Moseses that saved Moses. But I have to tell you about how I landed here at Lakeside. It was a cold and wintry night. I had just started working at Ecumen Lakeshore, not too far away. I was new to Duluth. I was living in an apartment without any furniture. I had an air mattress and my bare belongings, which I had brought, yes, in a backpack, all the way from Glasgow, Scotland with me. I came three months ahead of my partner, who would join me later from Scotland. But my job got me here December 1st, 2018. 
and it was dark and it was cold. I can't remember if it was snowing, but you know, it could snow any month here in Duluth. And I'd read in the paper about Lakeside Presbyterian having a Wednesday night supper. And if there's one thing that calls me to church, it's my stomach. So I decided, since it was in walking distance of work, that I would check it out. I didn't have a car. I didn't even have my driver's license because I didn't bother getting one in Britain. And so I was totally dependent on the bus. And I walked here on a Wednesday night, and I told people my name was Lindsay, and that was it. Because, you know, if you kind of get a, mm, I don't think I'll go back to that place kind of feeling, you don't want to have embarrassed yourself by over and you know, overexposing yourself and telling them your whole life story. and You just want them to forget you. So I sat down at a table. Remember, I had just moved from Glasgow, Scotland, with a backpack to Duluth, Minnesota. I sat down at a table, and I met a Mr. Eglinton. And he told me that his father was from Glasgow. And actually, there's a part of Glasgow called Eglinton. And so I told him I had just moved from Glasgow. And we sat and we visited, and he was very Minnesotan. He did not press me for details, but he was just warm and interested and told me about his life, and I told him a few details about my life, and I liked it. The food was also fantastic. So the next Wednesday, when I came back, I properly introduced myself I let people know that I was a new minister in town. I was the chaplain at Ecumen Lakeshore. I would be joining the Presbytery eventually. And, and I decided, yeah, this is where I want to associate. Because, of course, I belong to the Presbytery. But you are my home church now. And I want to thank Mary High, who introduced herself to me at Lakeshore. And I don't know if you remember this, Mary, but I asked you for a pledge card. And I've been one of you ever since. John and I are very happy to associate with Lakeside. And thank you for being our home church here in Duluth. Traveling across the water, I did it in an airplane. We know how this story turns out, don't we? We know that despite all of Pharaoh's efforts, God eventually allows God's people to go free. Go down, Moses. Hello, Pharaoh, let my people go. We know how this story ends. They cross the water safely with the walls of the sea divided and they can escape on dry land only to have the waters come crashing down upon the heavy military, iron and bronze carriages and armaments of the Egyptian army who get clogged under their own weight. And remember, the Israelites escape 
with only what they need on their backs. Only what they need to make their getaway. And then once in the wilderness, they have to plead for daily bread and for water that miraculously comes from a rock. All part of God's providence. But backing up, we know the stories from Sunday school. We know the stories about the exodus, about the wandering in the wilderness. But the story about how Moses himself gets saved as an infant is just should be dear to our hearts because he he was destined to die. He was ordered. He and all the other male babies that were to be born to Hebrew women, Pharaoh wanted to kill them. And you would think that with the Hebrews being the enslaved people that Pharaoh would want to raise up as many workers as he could. But see, Pharaoh's fear, Pharaoh's fear had made him irrational. His fear didn't even make sense to his own oppressive government. And fortunately, we have several sets of women who scupper Pharaoh's dictates. He orders the midwives to kill every Hebrew baby that is born. But they don't. And they not only ignore the Pharaoh's command, they make up a lie. They say, well, the Hebrew women give birth too early. They're too strong and vigorous. And so then Pharaoh has to order everybody to kill Hebrew boys. And for us people of the New Testament, this story, of course, reminds us of the Holocaust of the innocents that happens around the birth of Jesus. When Herod wants to go after this threat of a king of the Jews, when he is supposed to be the king of the Jews, and he orders every male three years and younger to be slaughtered, It's interesting that Jesus gets hidden by his parents in Egypt. The story that we're focusing on today. So we have this baby Moses who is born and is supposed to be killed. Now, the story gets personal for me. I'm a big sister. Who else here is a big sister? All right, let's hear it for big sisters. I was the third parent in our family. I helped raise my brother. I did a better job of raising him than my parents ever could. <laughs> Seriously. Moses' sister, after his mother has weaned him and puts him in what the Hebrew language calls an ark. That's what we have translated as basket, but it actually is ark. A story reminiscent of Noah and the ark. So here we have baby Moses in an ark being saved from Pharaoh's ravishing of male children. 
and his sister is standing a ways away, kind of keeping lookout like us big sisters do. I just went back for my brother and sister-in-law's 60th birthday. I still look after my baby brother. Lo and behold, who should come to the riverside but the Pharaoh's daughter to bathe? And she hears a cry amongst the reeds, the bulrushes, and she sees a basket. And upon opening the basket, upon opening this ark, there's a baby, and she has compassion. She also identifies this baby as one of the Hebrews. So there's no confusion on her part. And I find it amazing that the daughter of Pharaoh would go against her father's command. And she would have compassion on a child that was at the root of her father's fears. My belief is that the God of the Israelites was working through her, even though she was a daughter of Pharaoh. In fact, Scripture tells us that God works through our enemies. God worked through Pharaoh. God worked through the Babylonians and the Assyrians and all the other people. You know, the Israelites are not the light of the world because they're better or because they're holier. They are the light of the world when they know they need God. When they have only what can carry them through the day and nothing more. It's an interesting predicament because you would think, well, God helps those who help themselves. Well, that's not in the scriptures. God, in fact, helps those who need God. God helps those who need God. And who needs God more than enslaved people, children who have no hope of a future, folks in encampments, whole tribes of people wandering in their wilderness, wherever that is? Who needs God? but people who are without a home, without food security, without health care. Who needs God? That's who God helps. And so we have this daughter of the Pharaoh who works diametrically opposed to the powers that be. And this part I love. She institutes professional child care. It's in the Bible. <coughs> Moses' sister comes along and says, Would you like me to find a nursemaid to raise this child? And Pharaoh's daughter says, why, of course, I'm willing to pay. And I bet she paid really good wages, too. And so Moses' sister goes and gets their mother 
and the baby Moses is raised by his own mother who gets paid to raise him. Now, if that's not a commandment in the Bible, I don't know what is. It's interesting how God makes things turn out. And then, and this is speculation on my part, but just as Moses starts to enter those troublesome adolescent teenage years, his mother says, okay, it's now time for you to go and live with the Pharaoh's daughter. And so, like many women in the Bible, Hannah, who gave her son up to the priesthood, Mary certainly had to give Jesus up to his ministry. All children have to fly the nest. Moses goes and he lives in Pharaoh's court. A child who was destined to be murdered by Pharaoh is raised within the inner circle. And that's going to prove interesting. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Moses and the ark are rescued by the least likely person, the daughter of Pharaoh. In a family that was supposed to be broken apart by government dictates, is in fact paid to take care of one another. I love it. Friends, as we go forth, let us take only what we need so that we too reap the providential grace and care of God. Amen. Scripture reminds us it is not our things that matter to God. It is what comes from the heart. Let our tithes and offerings, including our time, talents, and resources, be dedicated to God at this time. Let's stand for the doxology. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God
Let us bring all of our prayers of thanks, our prayers for ourselves and our prayers for others, followed by the Lord's Prayer. And our prayer this morning is based on Psalm 124. Let us pray. Dear God, who is God, in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and when things are in chaos, we thank you. If it weren't for you, O oh God, who is always on the side of the nobodies, the enslaved, the undocumented, disenfranchised, excluded, despised. If it weren't for you, then we would find ourselves lost, under attack by enemies, overwhelmed by forces beyond our control. Thank you, O oh strong deliverer, for not giving up us for not giving us up for saving us instead saving us and spending us enjoying us and crying with us healing us especially when there is no cure thank you for enthusing us to love your justice to enact your kindness, to walk humbly with you, who loves each of us to love the loving and the unloving. Dear Heavenly Sustainer, we thank you for being our help in ages past and our hope for years to come. Like the birds of your creation, you release us to be freely yours, to be able to respond always to your will, to know deep in our guts, you are. Listen now as we seek once again to be and to do the prayer Jesus leads us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able and will join in singing our hymn of thanks. In unity we lift our song. What cause for celebration for those whose faithfulness has kept us through distress, who shared with us our plight, who held us in the night, the blessed For stories told and told again to every generation, to give us strength in times of pain, to give us consolation, our spirits to alive when we are far from home and evil seasons come. How firm is our foundation for sacred scriptures and found a blessed trust and trust. 
which gives us hope when hope is gone and makes us weep with pleasure. And when our eyes grow blind and death is close behind, we shall recite them still, whose hearts are Now, friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ free each one of us for service and for celebration. May the love of God cast out fear and give power to your lives. And may the community of the Holy Spirit enable us to go forward living on the raw edges of life with only what we need. Amen. <laughs>